Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you guys can take a seat. Uh, my name is Josh Miller, and I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're a guest with us here this evening, I just want to give you a special welcome. We're thrilled that you're here. Do me a favor. If you haven't already, stop by our first-time guest tent that is right out here in front of the building. We just uh, want to be able to follow up with you this week and also to give you a small gift just to say thank you for being with us uh, this evening. So for the last seven weeks and for a lot of the fall, we are going to be looking at the life of a man named Abraham. So we're going to spend about 17 weeks studying Abraham's life, and it's worth asking why spend so much time studying one person in the Bible? Why spend so much time studying Abraham? And the answer to that is that Abraham established the basic pattern of a relationship with God. So Abraham's uh, relationship with God serves really as the precursor to our relationship with God today. And so by looking at Abraham's life and his relationship with God, we learn a lot about our own lives. And today in Genesis chapter 17, we learn something that's, that's pretty simple about our relationship with God. And it's this, that a relationship with God includes both benefits and responsibilities. That it includes both benefits and responsibilities. And every healthy relationship that you have in your life works this way, right? If you're a pet owner, you know that there are benefits to owning a dog and there are responsibilities to owning a dog. If you are in a relationship or you're married, you know that there are benefits to marriage and there's responsibilities to marriage. If you have kids, there are benefits to having kids and there are responsibilities to having kids. Well, that is how all of life works. All healthy relationships work that way. But for whatever reason, a lot of people misunderstand this aspect of having a relationship with God. And I see that in our society working out in probably three big ways. The first is a group of people that focuses a lot on the responsibility side of knowing God. So, you know, these are folks that maybe grew up or are part of a really, really strict conservative church, and they're very concerned with the rules and keeping the rules, and they have strong Bible knowledge. But as you get to know them, they're not really defined by the fruit of the Spirit. You don't look at that person and think, man, they are really walking with God. They have a joyful, overwhelmingly vibrant relationship with God. They seem sort of stale and dead. That's, that's one mistake we can make. Well, there's another group of people that focuses almost exclusively on the benefits of a relationship with God, but none of the responsibilities. So this group very rightly talks about the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God, which is a good and, and wonderful thing to do. But they very rarely talk about the responsibility of being in a relationship with God. So they very rarely talk about the importance of repenting of sin and of growing in holiness. And too often, this group, when they come to something in the scriptures that they don't agree with, they sort of just move past it or they edit it out. And so they get the benefit side, but they're not really clear on the responsibility side. And then there's a third group of people that I think is growing the most rapidly in our society, and those are folks who would call themselves agnostic. So this group of people doesn't, they're not ready to say there's no God, but what they would say is, I just don't think you can know for sure. And because you can't know for sure, you can't have a relationship with God, right? I'd say that's the majority of my neighbors. They wouldn't say, hey, there is no God, but they'd say, there might be something out there, but I don't know for sure, and as a result, I can't have a relationship with whatever that thing is. Well, what I hope to do today is I hope to do my part to, to thoroughly ground your understanding of a relationship with God in the scriptures. And I want you to see from Abraham's life what a relationship with God looks like according to the Bible. And what we're going to find is what I said earlier, that it comes with both benefits and responsibilities. So if you have a Bible, open it to Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 1, as we're going to look at some of the incredible benefits and some of the responsibilities of being in a relationship with God. Here's what verse 1 says. When Abram was 99 years old, that's very old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So verses 1 and 2 serve as the prelude to this entire section of scripture. So this is sort of like the headline on a news article that kind of tells you everything you need to know and the news article fleshes out the details. Well, that's how this section of scripture works. Verses 4 through 14 really just flesh out what is said in verses 1 and through two. So let me point out just a couple of things from these first verses. Um, the first is this. This isn't a new covenant that God is making with Abraham, right? If you were here a couple weeks ago, you know we talked about Genesis chapter 15. God entered into a uh, covenant with Abraham, and he did so by grace, okay? So it wasn't because God looked down on all the earth and saw that Abraham was the, was the best person, and he said, okay, I'm going to be in a relationship with him. No, he came to Abraham out of sheer grace, and he enacted a covenant ceremony with him that was a little bit like a marriage ceremony. And what's interesting, I told you about chapter 15, is Abraham slept through the entire ceremony. Abraham slept through the entire ceremony. Not something I'd recommend you do during your wedding ceremony, okay? But that's what he did. And the reason for that was that it was all God. God did all of it. It wasn't because of Abraham's performance. So in chapter 17, what God does is he comes back around and he says, Abraham, you and I are in this relationship by grace, and now I want to help you understand what this relationship entails. 
I want you to understand the benefits that I'm extending to you. I also want you to understand the meaningful responsibilities that I'm calling you to in this relationship, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing I love is that um, Abram was 99 years old when God appeared to him. And what that means is that no matter what stage of life you're in, it's a good stage of life to know the Lord, okay? If you're 99, it's a good stage. If you're 19, if you're somewhere in between, God is never done with you if you are still breathing. All right, verses 3 through 14 are going to flesh out the benefits and the responsibilities that God established in these first two verses. Here we go. Verse 3, then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, behold, My covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, I love how Abram responded when God appeared to him. He fell on his face. And at that time, that was a posture of worship, and that was a posture of surrender. It's a very emotional response. And it was very, it was very telling for a 99-year-old man to do this. So Abram was old. He was established in the community. And yet, when the Lord appeared to him, he responded passionately. And what that shows us is that passionate worship is not just something that college students do. Okay, passionate worship is what we're all called to do. It's how we're all called to respond when we really know the Lord. And after Abram fell on the ground, God spoke to him. And basically, he reaffirmed the covenant that he'd made in chapter 15. And you might ask, why does God keep reaffirming this covenant? He's done it three times now in the last couple of chapters. And the reason, of course, is that we often forget, don't we? Don't we often need to be responded of God's promises in our lives and what the scriptures teach? If you're anything like me, you often forget. So God comes and he reminds Abraham, but he doesn't just remind him. He increases the promises. He amps up the promises. He turns up the volume, so to speak, on these promises. And he does it really in two ways. First, he says, Abraham, I'm not just going to give you descendants, kids and grandkids. I'm going to give you nations. He says, I'm going to have nations of people come from your descendants. And if you know anything about the history of the Jewish people and of the Arab people, both of them trace their lineage back to Abram, which means that roughly 5% of the people living on earth today trace their descendant, their, their lineage back to Abraham. So God made good on this promise. And as a result of this promise, God said, Abram, I'm going to change your name from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. So God says, I'm changing your name. This promise is so significant that this is going to change about you. And that's important. We're going to come back to that in just a second. So that's the first thing. The second thing God did was he promised to be the personal God of Abraham's descendants. He said, I will have a relationship with your descendants just like I have with you. And if you read the rest of Genesis, you find out that he did that. He appeared and interacted with Abram's son, Isaac, and with Isaac's son, Jacob, and with Jacob's 12 sons, which became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. So God amped up these promises in those two particular ways. Those are the benefits that he offered to Abram in this relationship. Now, your relationship with God and my relationship with God is not exactly like Abram's, right? God is not offering to be your real estate agent in the Middle East, okay? But it is a pattern. It sets the pattern of the benefits that God offers us in a relationship with him. We see two things in particular about our relationship that was true of Abram's relationship. And here's number one. The first benefit is that when you enter a relationship with God, God gives you a new identity. God gives you a new identity. Look, your name is really important to you, right? I mean, and we, we all like our names. We like to hear our names. I heard one person say that your name is your favorite word, right? Which is why it's a little bit offensive if someone forgets your name, right? Especially if they should know it, um, which reminds me of a story when I was offensive to Gabby, who's here tonight. Uh, a couple months ago, I was out front and people were coming up to the church service and Gabby walked up with one of her friends that I didn't know, but I didn't see Gabby. I just saw her friend. So I'm talking to her friend. I'm like, oh, you must be new. Like, you know, how long have you been in Charlottesville? Blah, blah, blah. And I turn without looking to Gabby. And I'm just like, oh, is this your first time at Center Church? And I'm like, oh, no. Because this is, it wasn't just not her first time at Center Church. She was a member of the church, right? Like, I had like had meaningful conversations with her. I knew all this stuff about her life. And I felt terrible. So like, as she was responding, I was like, I know your name is Gabby. I know that. Like, like no, 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 I know that, right? right? It's just kind of a little offensive if somebody forgets uh, your name and they're not supposed to. Um, Our names are a big deal. They're a big part of our identity, which is why people don't often change their names. And when someone does change their name, especially kind of a famous person, it's kind of big news, right? So I was thinking of what what are some of the most famous name changes in sort of popular culture? And I came up with a couple. Um, So in 1965, American musician John Mellencamp changed his name to John Cougar. I'm not sure why, but he changed it to John Cougar. In 2008, Cincinnati Bengals wide receiver Chad Johnson 
changed his name legally to Chad Ochocinco, if you remember that. And that was, I didn't know this, that was actually in, uh, in recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month. I didn't know that was true. Um, from 1993 to the year 2000, the musical artist Prince, Prince legally changed his name to a symbol, okay? It was a symbol that you couldn't pronounce, and so people just started to refer to him as the artist formerly known as Prince because they couldn't pronounce his new name. And probably the most famous example is back in the 1960s, um, Cassius Clay, uh, the boxer, changed his name to Muhammad Ali when he converted to Islam. And on a more practical level, we, we do this, right? Um, a lot of people do this when they get married, right? You change your last name when you get married. Why? Because something significant has changed in your life. Or a lot of people do this when they finish a doctoral program, right? You attach doctor, that prefix to the front of your name because you're like, I've been in school for 17 years and I now have $200 million worth of debt. I'm adding doctor to the front of my name, you know, like... I get it. Well, the, the, whole, the whole reason I say that is that we don't change our names lightly, and when we do, it means a lot, right? If you change your name, it is a fundamental change of your identity. Well, that is what God is saying to Abram. He's saying, look, Abram, this isn't, this isn't flippant. I am changing who you are. You are no longer Abram. You are now Abraham. Well, when you begin a relationship with God, God does the same thing in your life. He changes your name. Before your relationship with God spiritually, your name was sinner, broken, condemned and enslaved. But in Christ, you receive a new name, and your name is saint, empowered, justified, redeemed. If you are in a relationship with God, friend, your primary identity is no longer your education. It's not your salary level. It's not your economic bracket. It's not your physical appearance. It's not your relational status. It comes from your relationship with God. The apostle Paul put it this way in Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That is what God does when you enter into a relationship with you. He gives you an entirely new name. Now, you might ask me, okay, that's great, Josh. I guess that's true. The Bible says it, but why does that matter? Well, it matters because your identity shapes your self-image. Your identity shapes your self-image. It shapes how you think about yourself. Biblical counselor Paul Tripp says this, you are the most influential person in your own life because no one talks to you more than you do. You are the most influential person in your own life because no one talks to you more than you do. So here's the question. What are you telling yourself about yourself? What are you telling yourself about yourself? Are you telling yourself the truths of Scripture or are you telling yourself something that is no longer true of you? Are you saying, I'm just an anxious person? No, you're not. Are you saying, I'm just a broken person? Not anymore. Are you saying, I'm just a flawed, failed person? You are not anymore. You see, when God brings you into a relationship with him, he puts those things away and he gives you a new identity. But the truth is we don't often feel that, do we? Don't we often feel like we're still defined by our past mistakes or we're still defined by our flaws and our weaknesses and all that we're not rather than being defined by what God has declared that you are? So, so what do we do? We need to work the truth of our new identity from our head down into our hearts. The Apostle Paul called this being renewed in your mind in Romans chapter 12. He said, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to what the world says that you are, that, oh, you're overweight, or, oh, you're still single, or, oh, you're not smart enough, or, oh, you're not performing enough at work. That's what the world says that you are. And Paul says that's not true. Paul says you need to be transformed, how? By the renewal of your mind. You need to take the truths of Scripture, and you need to drive those down into your heart because that is your new identity. Right? So how do you do that? Well, you take scripture, uh, truths of Scripture and you think them over. You say this, I have a clean slate and I am no longer controlled by my past mistakes. Psalm 103, verses 11 through 12. I am no longer a slave to sin, but I am an overcomer by grace. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. I am not alone in the world. I am not forsaken. I am not abandoned, but I have been brought into the family of God. Galatians chapter 4. I've been adopted. I am not pointless. My job is not a waste of my life. I have a high calling as an ambassador of Christ. There's no higher calling that you could possess, 2 Corinthians 5.20. And I am no longer a failure. I'm no longer defined by my weaknesses. I am no longer enslaved to sin, but I have a new empowerment through the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3.16. The scriptures say the very spirit that created the cosmos now dwells in you so that you can overcome sin and you can put it to death and you can be a part of God's kingdom expanding here in the world. Friends, one of the greatest benefits of entering into a relationship with God is that he gives you a new name. But my question is, are you living that way? Are you living like you have a new name or are you living like your old name? Are you using a fake ID? 
Are you still using that identification from before you became a Christian and you're living under bondage and you're living under guilt and you're living under shame that you don't have to live under anymore? The first benefit of a relationship with God that we see from this text is that he gives you a new identity. Here's the second thing that we see. Letter B, God promises to be your God. God promises to be your God. Two times in verses 7 and 8, God said of Abraham's descendants, I will be their God, possession, their personal God. Now, that statement doesn't really impact us like it would have impacted them. And the reason is that in Abraham's culture, people spent a lot of time trying to get various gods to be their God. So in the springtime, you would make sacrifices to the fertility goddess because you wanted her to be your goddess for the, for the growing season. In the fall, you would make a sacrifice to the god of harvest because you wanted him to be your god for the harvest. If you went to war, you would make a sacrifice to the god of war because you wanted him to be your god during that battle. They spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort trying to get these gods to be their god for just a little bit of time. Now, it's easy for us as modern people to sort of laugh and shake our heads and say, those silly superstitious people. But I would suggest that we do the same thing, just in different ways. Why do you work so many hours, check your email after dinner and before bed? Why are you responding to things at 1130 at night? Why are you saying yes to every single work trip? Why are you so enslaved to work? Because you want the God of career to bless you. Why do you go to the gym five times every week? Why do you eat such an expensive particular diet? Why do you get on the scale every single night? Because you want the God of body image to bless you. Right? Why, why do you always agree with your classmates? Why do you hide your beliefs? Why are you afraid of conflict? Because you want the God of acceptance to bless you. The truth is, you and I are not that different from the people in Abraham's time. We just do it in a different way. We spend a lot of time, and we spend a lot of energy, and we spend a lot of emotional capacity, and a lot of money running around trying to get this God to be our God for just a little bit. Maybe my classmates will just accept me if I say this. Maybe I'll get that next promotion if I just do that. We're like, just, just be my God for a few days. But here's what we all know. Here's what we've all learned through experience the hard way. There is no number on the scale low enough, and there is no number in your salary that's high enough to fill that deep longing for satisfaction and significance and worth that you have. No matter how well you do at getting that God to bless you, you're always going to have to go back for more. It's always temporary which is what makes this promise so amazing. God came to Abraham and his descendants, and God comes to you in Christ and says, I'm not just offering to be God generally. I'm offering to be God to you personally. I'm offering to be your God, and you don't have to run around offering sacrifices to me all the time in order to make that happen. I will be your personal God. I will be obligated to you, and I will care about your life. But I don't think that many of us are living that way. Here's what I think happens. Most of us believe that the Lord is God, but how many of us live like the Lord is my God? Most of us believe that the Lord is God. At least I think a lot of people do. But how many of us live like the Lord is my God? What would happen if you left here tonight not just acknowledging, yes, the Lord is God, but the Lord is my God? The Lord is my God at my job. The Lord is my God in my home. The Lord is my God as I try to deal with all the drama that's happening in my life. How would that change you? Well, I think you would stop grasping for the next thing because you would trust God's timing. You would say, if the Lord is my God then, and I'm not in a relationship right now, then I guess I'm just not supposed to be in a relationship. If I haven't gotten the promotion yet, I guess I'm not supposed to have the promotion yet. If I don't have the child yet, I'm not supposed to have the child yet. You'll stop grasping because the Lord is your God. If the Lord is your God, you'll be less controlled by people's opinions of you. You'll stop worrying so much about, man, do my friends accept me? Do, am I saying the right things on social media? Am I, am I nodding in the right ways? You'll, be, you'll, be, you'll stop being so afraid of being rejected because you'll say, man, the, the Lord of all creation has accepted me. He is my God, so I actually don't need the acceptance of this group of people, and it frees me to be more thoughtful about them. When you don't need people, you can actually serve people. I think finally it would, it would empower you to live with poise and peace in the midst of this crazy world that we live in. Because if you know that the Lord is your God, that, that the one rock that will never move, the one foundation that can never be shaken, if you know that that God is your God, then you can have poise and peace in the midst of all the uncertainty that we live in every day. Friends, here's the amazing news. When you begin a relationship with God through Christ, he doesn't just... He doesn't just promise to be God generally. He promises to be God personally to you. To be God Almighty, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God in your life. 
today as you leave. That is what blew Abram away. That is why he fell down on his face in worship, because he understood what an incredible benefit that was. So God offers to give you a new identity. He offers to be your God. Those are the benefits that we have in Christ. So what are the responsibilities? What did God call Abraham to do? And what do we learn from that about what he's calling us to do? Well, that's what's next. Look at verse 9 with me. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall, shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. I was so excited to preach a whole sermon on circumcision, huh? Um, so here's the deal. What did God call Abram to do in response? To be circumcised, okay? And I'm not going to go into detail about what that means, but if you have questions, we have lots of nurses in our congregation, okay? And I'm sure that they could let you know, <laughs> okay? But he, here's the idea about circumcision. It was extremely personal, private, and painful. I mean, it is the most personal thing that God could ask Abraham to do. And it's a big deal in the Bible. All throughout the Old Testament, the Jews refer to themselves in shorthand as the circumcised. And everybody else as the uncircumcised. In Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul is giving his spiritual resume and he lists his circumcision. I don't think we would do that today, right? Like, man, I have a great quiet time. I'm a part of a missional community and I've been circumcised. You know, oh, okay, that's weird. Um, right? But that's what Paul did because it's a big deal in the Bible. It's a very important symbol. So what I, what I want to do is I want to help you understand this symbol. Now, this symbol has been replaced for New Testament Christians. So you can take a big, deep breath, okay? Some of you are like getting nervous there. Um, it's been replaced by the symbol of baptism. So today, baptism sort of functions in that same way. But it's important for us to understand circumcision because it helps us understand what we're called to in a relationship with God. All right? So let me, let me make a very obvious point. Circumcision is an all or nothing deal right? It's an all or nothing deal. There's no being halfway circumcised. It's not like you can be nominally circumcised. Like it's a big commitment. And God was clear that every single male in Abraham's family was to do this. He said, your sons, anybody that's in your household, your descendants. And God said, if anyone doesn't do this, they are outside of my covenant. They're outside of our relationship, right? So God, God said, hey, I want this thing to be done. It is extremely personal and it applies to everyone that's going to be in a relationship with me. And it teaches us what our responsibility is when we're in a relationship with God, which is this, let her see, you're called to go all in. You're called to go all in. This is hard for us as Americans because we tend to compartmentalize our lives, don't we? So like this compartment over here is, you know, uh, work and this compartment over here is, man, relationships and this is money and this is sexuality and then here's God. And we like having God like in one of our compartments, but we, you know, we kind of keep them all, we kind of keep them all separate. But what God is saying here all the way back in Genesis 17 is I'm not interested in being one of your compartments. I'm interested in being the Lord of all your compartments. I mean, he went to the most personal, most private thing about Abraham's life, and he said, that's where the symbol's going to be. Which tells us that God wants to be the Lord of the areas that you don't want him to be involved in. Right? I'm not interested in being one of your compartments. I'm interested in being the whole thing. You see, friends, beginning a relationship with God is a bit like having a Copernican revolution of the soul. You remember who Copernicus was, right? This is like hearkening back to high school science class. So Copernicus was an astronomer. And before Copernicus, everyone thought that the earth was the center of the solar system and all the planets in the sun orbited around the earth. But what Copernicus realized and demonstrated was that the earth was not the center of the solar system, but that the sun was and that everything orbited around the sun. But when you begin a relationship with God, this is what happens you realize that you're actually not supposed to be the center of your solar system. You're not supposed to be the center of your universe. God is. God is. And everything in your life, the planet of relationships and of money and of commitment to the church and of sexuality and all the things, they don't go away. But when you begin a relationship with God, they're supposed to start orbiting around God. So now, rather than asking the question, man, what do I want to do with my money? What do I want to do with my time? You ask the question, what is God calling me to do? Instead of asking, what do I think about my sexuality? What do I think about my relationships? You say, man, what does God's word say? To grow in Christ increasingly means to have all the planets of your life orbiting around God's will and God's word rather than your own. 
That is what God is calling us to. He was calling Abraham to it back then, and he's calling us to it as well. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That is a call to all in discipleship. What this teaches us is that there's no, like, varsity and JV level of Christian. That's what most Americans think, that there's sort of like people who are really serious about about Christianity, and they're involved in small groups, and then there's everybody else, right? And they, you know, go twice a month, and they, you know, give a little bit, and that's kind of what you do. But what, what the text is saying is, like, there's actually no middle ground. If you are in a relationship with God, this is what God calls us to, all in discipleship. And around here at Center Church, we simply call this first priority faith, first priority faith, which simply means this, in response to the gospel, Jesus and his mission will be first in my life. First priority faith. That is what we believe Jesus is calling all of his disciples to. That's what it says in the scriptures. And that is what we want to be known for as a church. But the truth is, all of us have areas of our life where we're not living with first priority faith, don't we? We all have planets, so to speak, that are not orbiting around God. They're orbiting around us. And what this text calls us to do is it calls us to evaluate those things. And it calls us to take a step of faith. And to say, God, this area of my life has not been orbiting you. It's been orbiting me, and I want to repent, and I want it to orbit around you. Look, I don't know what your step is. I don't know what area of your life God is impressing on you and calling you to take a step, but I know that there's a step. And what Abraham teaches us is that there there is no stage of life that exempts you from this, right? I know a lot of times it's like, well, I'm in college. I'll get serious later. I'm a young pro. I'll get serious later. I have young kids. I'll get serious later. Now I'm an empty nester. I'll get serious later. Abram was 99 years old. And God said, I want you to get circumcised. Okay, I don't know if you know many 99-year-olds. I don't, but I'm 32 and my back hurts. Can you imagine having surgery at 99? Like, oh my goodness. Like, there is no stage of life that exempts you from God's call to discipleship. There's just not. So the question is, and what is God calling you to do? For some of you, it might be baptism, right? Baptism is the New Testament symbol that replaced circumcision. So when somebody comes to faith in Christ today, the scriptures would call you to be baptized. So that's why if you came up here and said, Pastor Josh, I want to give my life to Christ, I'd pray with you. I would not then hand you a card with UVA Medical Center's number on it, right? I would say, hey, we're doing a baptism service on September 20th. Let's talk more about that. Truth be told, this stage actually turns into a baptistry. Isn't that kind of cool? It's underneath there. It's like the secret thing. Um, And we're going to do a baptism service on September 20th. We already have some folks that are signed up to do that. If that's you, if you need to take that next step, if you've never done it, man, we want to talk to you about it. Baptism might be your step. The way you go public and you say, God, I'm all in for you. Or for you, it might be attending what we call the Weekender. All right, the Weekender is an event that we host about every six weeks, and it is your one-stop shop for getting more connected here. I know for a lot of people, it's easy to sort of stay on the edges of the church, right? And attend, but never get like deeply involved because there's always some reason that you can't. And I get that life is complicated, particularly right now. And I've talked to some of you that have said, man, I want to get more connected, you know, after we don't have to wear masks anymore. And I understand that. But like the reality is we don't know how long that's going to happen, right? There's always a reason to delay getting serious about your relationship with the local church. But maybe God is calling you to get connected, right? The weekender is fun. It, we eat a lot of good food together that's individually packaged now. We, <laughs> we sit, you know, the appropriate distances. You just get to know people. You get to know Justin and I. You hear more about our history and mission as a church. You learn about how to build meaningful relationships here and how to get connected serving and all those things. So maybe for you, your first priority step of faith this fall is to attend the weekend. That might be it. It might be something um, less event-oriented. Maybe it's, man, you just need to build a relationship with someone that's in a different stage of life than you or has a different color skin than you, right? Maybe you've been looking at what's going on in our world and it burdens you and, and, and you wanna be a part of creating greater diversity in the church. Well, maybe God is saying, hey, start with a relationship. Start by building a bridge and building a relationship. Press into the uncomfortableness of meeting someone new. You could start that outside after the service, right? I don't, I don't know what it is for you, right? God is moving in you right now in a way that I don't know, but I know it's something. I know for a fact that God is calling you to go all in with him because that's how it has always been with relationships with God. It has always been that. But the question is, why do we struggle so much to do it? I'd say the same reason that Abraham probably struggled with this command, right? Being all in with God is uncomfortable and scary, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure Abraham was like, I'm sorry, are you sure, God? Like, this is the definition of uncomfortable and scary. So why did Abraham go through with it? Well, I think it's because Abraham was like, man, God, you've been so gracious to me. You've been so kind to me. 
You have re-engaged with me time after time after time that I trust you. And even though this is uncomfortable and scary, I'm going to go through with it. I'm going to put my yes on the table, God, and I'm going to do what you've called me to do. Friends, the way that you get the courage and you get the faith to take your step of first priority faith is by looking not to Abram, but to the one that Abraham foreshadowed, which is Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ didn't give a compartment of his life for you. He gave the whole thing. To do God's will, Jesus wasn't just injured like Abraham. He was torn apart. He was torn apart on the cross. The reason that you can have a new identity and the reason that God can be your God, hear me, is because Jesus traded places with you. Your sin deserved condemnation, but Jesus took that condemnation in your place. God pours out grace over you because God poured out wrath over Jesus. You know what the scriptures say? The scriptures say that Jesus was so disfigured by the beatings and the floggings and the crucifixion that you couldn't even recognize him. You know what that means? He lost his identity for you. And the scriptures say that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what that means? Jesus lost his relationship with the Father so that you could gain it. God stopped being his God in that moment so that he could start being yours. Friends, any God that would go to those lengths to give you a new identity and to be in a personal relationship with you is not only trustworthy, is not only good, but is worth going all in for. So let, let the pattern of Abraham's response be the pattern of your response. Let the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ move you to say, Jesus, you and your mission are going to be first in my life. Would you bow your heads and pray with me?